Hey everyone, how's it going? Today we're going to be talking about unions, a thing that has been gaining more steam here in the United States in recent years. The union that I want to talk about today, though, was much less a union in the workers' rights sense and more a union in that it forcibly destroyed and replaced trade unions. This was the singular quote-unquote trade union that was permitted to exist back in Nazi Germany. This was the German Labor Front, also known simply as the DAF. Shortly after Hitler came to power in late January 1933, Nazi militants, aka the SA or the Brown Shirts, began attacking trade union offices and its leaders. Hitler had long since viewed labor unions and their leaders as spreaders of Marxism and Jewish subversion and perhaps, most importantly, a force that would lessen his power and grasp on the German citizens. To eliminate this threat to him, Hitler ordered on May 2, 1933, that the unions be destroyed, their funds taken, and their leaders jailed. However, as Hitler was still in the early stages of his rule, and didn't have the ability to reign as a complete dictator at this stage, he did still have to be somewhat mindful of public opinion and public support. Because of this, the destruction of the more traditional labor unions led to the creation of a new centralized union that government leadership promised would be everything the old unions were and more. In reality, though, the German labor front was more a mechanism to help keep workers under government control. Appointed to head the DAF was Robert Ley, a former soldier in World War I and a PhD in chemistry. Joining the Nazi party in 1925, Ley was privately more open to the more left-leaning elements of the early stages of the party, and he aligned somewhat with Gregor Strasser. However, Ley would publicly align with Hitler and his public commitment to him, would earn him a great deal of respect and power. Early in his leadership of the DAF, Ley would show his general lack of leadership experience and a man named Reinhold Mukau began to supersede his authority. While Ley may have been privately sympathetic to the early left-wing elements of the party, Mukau was much more open with his left-wing sympathies, and under his influence, the early stages of the DAF actually saw it align with workers in calling for better wages and working conditions. However, after Mukau died in September 1933 in a car accident and business leaders began complaining to the Nazi government, Ley's control over the DAF was re-established and any left-wing elements in the DAF were stamped out accordingly. From that point on, the DAF was effectively a coalition of business owners, employers, and the German government, most critically, that controlled labor in Germany. As part of the group structure, a group of so-called labor trustees appointed by Hitler would handle the negotiations of employee contracts and working conditions. In concept, this board of trustees would consider the interests of both the employees and employers in their decisions in an effort to promote some idea of social harmony and labor peace. In practice, however, employees had basically no say in the actions of the board. The board generally followed the interests of employers and the state, and employees could not in any way oppose the decisions made by the board. Striking and collective bargaining was outlawed, so whatever the board said was final and workers just had to deal with it. Additionally, while the board technically had the power to set wages, Hitler decreed that wages were to be kept low and should not increase. This meant that workers were now stuck with low wages and zero bargaining power. Even on the rare occasions when they tried to strike, they were arrested and effectively barred from further employment. A grand total of 32 million workers would be part of the DAF, and while enrollment in the DAF was technically voluntary and up to each worker, being a member of it was required of almost any job in Germany effectively making it mandatory for you to be a member. Upon joining, workers were provided with their own membership booklet, seen here. This booklet was basically their proof of membership and was a key part of their participation as a member. 
seen on the screen is the one that I recently bought, and because there were millions of Germans in the DAF, they aren't that expensive or really difficult to get, but still interesting nonetheless. So I figured we'd go over what's in one of these membership books. On the inside cover is a quote that roughly translates to, and keep in mind I'm using Google Translate for this, one may be active wherever he is. He must never forget that the nation only lives through the work of everyone. Basically, it's just a motivational statement saying work together for the nation. On the first page, we have the name of the DAF along with the quote, work is creation, work is discipline. On the next page, we have another quote that basically says you shouldn't judge somebody for the job they have, which is actually kind of a nice sentiment. Then we have the book owner's personal information, the date they joined the DAF, their current job, and some disclaimers that say each person is responsible for the book and not to lose it. We have space for previous employment, a spot for the book to be approved, and it had to be approved with a stamp or else the entire book was considered invalid. Then we have a section for membership dues. It was through these dues that the DAF made its money, and quite a lot of money at that. Dues were paid on a monthly basis, and every stamp marks that month's payment. Dues could also be paid in bulk, seen here with a large ink stamp, paying several months at once. The amount you paid depended on what membership group you were in, numbered from 1 to 20, with dues increasing as the group number increased. I should note that on Wikipedia and various other online sources, it says dues range from around 15 cents to three Reichsmarks, but my book here shows stamps going up to group 14, costing 5.4 Reichsmarks. Either I'm reading the stamps incorrectly somehow, or Wikipedia and various other websites are incorrect in some way. Regardless of that, though, these dues would raise a substantial amount of money. As tens of millions of German citizens were in the DAF, it would raise hundreds of millions of Reichsmarks each year. For the rest of the book, we have sections for sick leave, sections for emergency support and death benefits, and a section that, if authorized, would let a worker suspend payment of their dues for a given time. And finally, on the back cover, we have a little advertisement for Nazi propaganda papers and journals promoting things like the attack, the Volkisch Observer, labor, and the structure or the expansion, depending on how you read it. In addition to having this book, the DAF also mandated workbooks for every worker, which listed that worker's skills and past employment. Finding employment without your workbook was also all but impossible, and your employer would hold on to your workbook while you were employed with them. If the employer so desired, if you wanted to leave your job, they could simply refuse to give your book back to you, making it impossible to find a new job. In effect, this gave employers, and by proxy the government, the ability to force people to continue working in certain areas. For the government, though, this was a good thing as it meant that they could forcibly maintain the workforce in certain industries, keeping production levels high. With this bevy of new requirements and restrictions in place and the decrease in workers' rights overall, the DAF, on the surface at least, wanted to do something to help make up for it, to throw the workers a bone and try and make them happy. For this, they would create the Strength Through Joy program, a multifaceted program that would grant workers access to fun activities like sports, theater and concerts, and even subsidized holidays and cruises. This program would be incredibly popular both within Germany and around the world, with citizens and politicians alike in Britain and the United States praising their efforts. Millions of Germans would participate in the program, going on cruises and holidays to island resorts and other countries, attending concerts and plays, and even just going on organized hiking adventures. On the surface, the Strength Through Joy program was wildly successful and did a great deal to increase the morale and overall happiness of those in Germany. Scratch beneath that surface, though, and you begin to see the program's flaws and its true purpose. While making workers a bit happier was one of the aims of the program, 
the greater aims were more propagandistic and controlling. Of course, because the Nazis banned a great deal of art and entertainment because it didn't fit into Nazi cultural ideals, Strength Through Joy held significant propagandistic value by feeding workers content and activities that directly suited these ideals. It acted as reinforcement of Nazi propaganda concealed through entertainment. Additionally, the program was designed to control what little free time the workers had. As wages were capped and the only way to make more money was to work more, this left people with a lot less free time to socialize and partake in their own activities. Even in this limited time, if people are out socializing on their own, outside the purview of the government, they could be organizing, trying to fight against the system itself, and this the Nazis wanted to prevent. By having the government organize these programs, people basically didn't have the opportunity to organize in any way that was a threat to the government. In these programs, their free time and their leisure was structured and controlled by the government. Then there was also the fact that the program promised much more than it could really achieve. People were presented with limited options and could only partake in Nazi-approved content. Then there was the fact that people were often provided with low-quality accommodations. Theater seats were often the cheap seats, hotel rooms were often cheap and unkempt, the food quality was often poor, and participants of the cruises and holidays often couldn't afford to buy much of anything that would actually improve their stay. In effect, this created a situation where participants in the program were often envious of higher-class Germans who could attend these events on their own dime, those who could afford to do what they wanted and buy what they wanted. While one of these stated goals was indeed to reduce the class divide in Germany, but only among German citizens, and unify the German people, these programs actually did more to reinforce the class divide and showed how much more the upper classes of Germany had. But still, the program was wildly popular as it did give people cheaper vacations, so I guess that was still a plus. A broken clock is right twice a day, I suppose. Even then, though, to quote a labor front official in 1940, a relaxing cruise on a luxury steamer does not really bring relaxation if the tourist has to go back at the end to the material oppressiveness of his everyday existence. But back to the German labor front as a whole, there are two final points that I want to discuss shortly. Profits and corruption. A major part of the overall Nazi economic plan was to increase production levels for the upcoming war they knew they were about to start. To aid in this, they needed the cooperation of big business. Sure, they could nationalize everything and control it themselves, but it was much more expedient to try and satisfy business leaders and use the motive of increased profits in conjunction with government pressure to help increase production. Plus, with Nazi restrictions on wages and workers' rights through the DAF, business leaders ideally didn't have to worry all that much about excess spending on wages or worker quality of life. In this environment of decreased hourly wages and increased production, wage earnings as a percent of national income fell by 11% between 1932 and 1938. Keep in mind that 1932 was still around the Great Depression. Meanwhile, the income of the top 10% in Germany increased from 37% to 39% between 1928 and 1936. And again, keep in mind that 1928 was just before the Great Depression. Additionally, even with worker wages restricted already, their true take-home wages would drop further still on account of required payments to the DAF and Strength Through Joy programs and effectively required charity payments to programs like Winter Relief. Because of these added deductions, take-home wages fell further by as much as 30%. Then, on the corruption front, the DAF may have been seen as the most corrupt agency in Nazi Germany, and Robert Ley, the man at the head, was the primary beneficiary. In addition to a decent but still relatively modest salary totaling around 7,000 Reichsmarks, adjusting for inflation, this is around $60,000 today, 
Lay would make an additional 50,000 Reichsmarks per year off newspaper, book, and pamphlet revenue, the latter two of which people in the DAF were encouraged to read and buy. Lay would also give himself rather free reign of the funds that were confiscated from the trade unions when they were destroyed by the government. Then, in 1940, Ley was given a generous gift of one million Reichsmarks from Hitler. Ley would use his now substantial wealth to purchase himself villas, expensive cars, paintings, farmland, railway carriages, alcohol, and really whatever else he wanted. His exploits in drinking and womanizing became so well known that Hitler had to ask him to tone things down a little bit, a request that Ley ignored. And while Ley was the poster child for DAF corruption, it certainly didn't stop with him. Officials in the DAF frequently partook in embezzlement and general corruption, from outright bribes to various gifts and quote-unquote loans, DAF funds were used and abused. Higher-ranking officials used DAF funds to buy themselves expensive luxury goods, like expensive homes, hunting equipment, vacations, and luxury silk clothing. Outside observers would note that at the DAF headquarters in Berlin, the number of expensive luxury cars parked outside would grow substantially, no doubt a result of the misappropriation of DAF funding. So, overall, what can be said of the German labor front? Built as the replacement to the previous trade unions, the DAF existed less as a traditional union and more as a tool to help control the working class in Germany, to increase production for rearmament and the eventual war, and line the coffers of the Nazi party. While it did, on the surface, serve some of the functions of a more traditional union, and in the earliest stages, it actually did in some regards, it effectively functioned as an anti-union union, a union of the German government and business leaders to help control the working people and increase war production. Sure, they did offer some benefits to try and placate the German population, but even these things were just a means to an end. Efforts to prevent strikes and resistance while also quietly instilling Nazi social and political values. In the end, the DAF was just another tool of government control and power, shrouded in populist language and general gestures to the happiness of workers. All right, and with that, I think we'll go ahead and end for today. So thank you all for watching the video. Uh, remember to like, comment, and subscribe. I really like that little membership book that I found. I think it's really interesting, and it was my motivation to make this video in the first place. I managed to translate a good deal of it thanks to Google Translate, but unfortunately I can't make out a lot of the cursive writing in it. I never was good at reading other people's cursive for whatever reason. Maybe I'll figure it out one day though. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, I hope you watch my next one, and I hope you learned something from this one. So, see ya!